Hey fellow explorers, in the changing world of travel, things change for the better and things change for the worse. But in this video, I'm gonna be counting down 10 of the travel trends that have overstayed their welcome and we need to show the door in 2024. I've got bones to pick with the airline industry, with the hotel industry, with the tech industry, with uh, us as influencers and with uh, ugly tourists too. Now, this isn't just all about the worst things because everybody knows if you're here often at Yellow Productions, I don't like to be the world's biggest complainer. So in addition to 10 trends that we need to show the door and stop in 2024, I've also got seven trends that we can look forward to in 2024, some of those positive changes that I alluded to earlier. So the first trend that really needs to stop in 2024 is the decline of hospitality. Yes, a big part of travel is about making people feel welcome, giving them a little bit extra customer service. But you know, where we've really seen the decline of hospitality is in the full service hotel segment. Think the standard Marriott and Hilton type hotels, hotels that used to provide a little bit of everything and great service and now seem to provide very, very little. It seems like in the hotel industry, particularly in the USA, uh, there has been a gigantic race to the bottom to see which hotel chain can provide the absolute least service to their guests. Uh, in particular, I hear this uh, from y'all. I experience it myself. Housekeeping, room cleaning services gets worse and worse. And this isn't an issue necessarily all around the world, but certainly in the USA, Hotels have found that they can cut costs by not cleaning rooms as frequently. And before COVID time, it used to be like you would get your room cleaned every day by default anywhere you stayed. And now there's many properties where they won't clean your room every day. Maybe they'll only clean it every other day. Maybe they'll only clean your room every four days. Uh, and now there's plenty of people who say like, Chris, I don't need my room cleaned every day. Maybe you don't, but some people do. If you're traveling with a big family, lots of kids, you might want that daily housekeeping. It should be something we should opt out of instead of having to beg and plead and then have them say, oh, no, if you want housekeeping, it's actually gonna cost you more. Something you used to get for free. And we're certainly not getting a discount on that room rate because we don't get the housekeeping anymore. Mm. The other thing we see in hotels in the decline of hospitality is less and less in-room amenities. And this was another COVID time thing where like, oh, all those things that used to be in the bathroom where you had like little hand soaps and lotions and Q-tips and all that stuff. Well, we took that away so that other people didn't touch it and you didn't touch what other people touched, but you know what? They've never, they've never come back. <laughs> you know, back at Weston and Sheraton properties, they used to have mouthwash, vanity kits, shaving kits, and a shoe mint in every room. Sheraton even had loofahs in their rooms. And all those things are gone and have not made their way back, which is one of the reasons why uh, I really like to stay at Japanese hotels. They're amazing compared to anything in the West or the USA. Uh, you go to a Japanese hotel in Japan and you'll find a pyramid of soap bars. You'll find multiple bottles of lotions, shampoos, combs, razors, toothbrushes, toothpaste, even pajamas in your room too. And they'll replace it all daily. Anything you use comes back the absolute next day. The one like bright light in the USA that still hasn't succumbed to this as a chain or brand is Hyatt. Hyatt is still doing pretty well in this area. They have this program called Hyatt Has It. Uh, and if you go down in the front desk and you're like, hey, can I get, I, I forgot my toothbrush. Do you have one? Guess what? Hyatt, because Hyatt has it. They have a toothbrush for you. And they're not going to charge you the $12 that Marriott will for it. Uh, Tim Watts agrees that the trend we need to stop is stop with the wall mounted shampoo and other amenities. And this is one uh, love to hate. And so I agree with you, Tim, I don't like the wall mounted shampoos, soaps, body wash, that sort of stuff. Uh, but I particularly don't like it when they don't fill it up. 
You know, it's like, this is one of these like statements to be like, oh, we put this in here to be eco-conscious. Really the reason why they put them in there is to cut costs so that they don't have to put as much stuff in your room, but then they just don't check it at all. They're like, well, we, we only check those soaps once every month to make sure they're full. And now instead of calling somebody up and saying, hey, can I get more soap? And then they just bring me a bottle that they hand to me. Now someone's gotta like come all the way in my room. They gotta like either fill that one up or take that off the wall. It is a much bigger deal to have those wall mounted shampoos and soaps replaced than it was to use the little ones. And I frankly am someone who likes to take those little soaps home and use them later. That's actually how I discovered Le Labo soaps was from staying at Park Hyatt. And I'm like, I really like these soaps. Uh, College Full of Love says Hyatt has it great marketing. Indeed, that is a total uh, great phrase. I like plus one to whoever came up with that. All right, the second trend that needs to stop in the travel world in 2024 are the airplane seats that keep getting thinner. If you've been following the travel news lately, you might know where this picture comes from. This picture comes to us courtesy of Southwest Airlines, you can see that little heart right up there. Uh, and Southwest Airlines released uh, these pictures and they released like a TikTok video about their sleek new seats. Uh, to which people looked at these seats and say, oh, they look like the Ozempic of airline seats. That's a weight loss drug, if you're not familiar with Ozempic. Uh, many people have said these new airline seats look about as comfortable as wooden benches. Uh, people have compared them to lawn chairs and customers have been asking if they need to bring their own seat cushions on their next Southwest Airlines flight. Uh, and, uh, you know, some people have also said that uh, it looks like I'm going to be relaxing on a slate of granite. Of course, Southwest Airlines responds to all of this and says that these images were 2D renderings to show the cosmetic look of the seats and were not scalable for illustrating seat comfort. But you can rest assured that we have our customers back even when they give us flack. They've got some great marketing people at Southwest Airlines that are a poet when they didn't even know it. But I, for one, you know, there's like, I, I, to me, I, they'll say like, oh, there's some science behind like, we can make the seats, the, the, the seat thinner, but we can, we provide better foam or better cushioning. And so it's more comfortable than it was before. I've really yet to find that. I find that when I get these like ultra low profile seats, they're really not that comfortable because they don't have that much give, they don't have that much sink in, they really do feel like hard granite slabs that you lean up against. Uh, Emmett Brown says, those look like bus seats. They do, kind of like a bus in the air, right? I think that's what we're getting relegated to. Uh, you know, there was a, a, a joke I've heard in the airline industry when it comes to like budget carriers and things like that is that like people will do anything to give a discount. Like if an airline came out and said, well, um, we'll give you $20 off your airline ticket as long as you let us kick you in the shin as you're boarding. There are people, I think, who would take them up on that offer to get their $20 off for the kick in the shin before they board. Connie says, I prefer the old Southwest seats, way more padding and better legroom compared to American Airlines. Exactly. American Airlines is one who went all in on this like super thin seat design and they're awful. Like for an hour flight, they're fine. But for a 10 hour flight, you know, LA to Tokyo, they're really, really bad. Uh, Emmett says my butt falls asleep just looking at those. Uh, and then Rich says another Airbus. Yeah, not just the brand Airbus. <laughs> and Brian says, at least Southwest doesn't have the awkward seats that face backwards anymore. That's true. That is pretty awkward to sit in a seat that faces backwards. Uh, I think that often that was like the flight attendant that would sit there and look at you or something like that. Uh, and Sean says, trains are greater than planes, which you know what? Train travel is a trend we're going to talk about in the what's good in travel in 2024. And Sean, you're right. I think train travel is definitely having a resurgence and might be where things are looking up in 2024. Tim says, Chris, I would not take the kick in the shin for $20. I would need at least 25. All right, Tim, Southwest is probably taking a note of this. And so they'll make sure they put the shin kick category discount at $25 for you. Uh, there's more outdoors though, said $20 off. Sign me up. As I said, there's gonna be somebody who will get in line for that $20 off. Uh, Kathy, joining from Tokyo Disney. Welcome, Kathy. Good to see you. 
And Alex says, American Airlines may be a legacy carrier, but I wouldn't fly them if I was desperate. Yes, and we have these legacy carriers in the USA, American Delta United, that generally charge more than other carriers because they provide more comfort, more legroom, all that stuff. But it seems like all of those things that they provided more of, they slowly winnow, winnow, and take away until the point that there's no differentiation as to pay the big rates. And so then everybody will just go fly the discount carrier. The third travel trend that we need to stop in 2024 are the ugly tourists. Uh, and what's an ugly tourist? An ugly tourist are tourists who go to a country or a place, a city, and harass the locals. One example uh, where this has been in the news recently is in Kyoto, Japan. This is a uh, traditional Japan home of the geishas, the women who wear kimonos and white makeup, and they like legitimately still do that today. And there are some streets that they tend to hang out on, and tourists have been harassing them. And so the government there has had to put up these signs. I'm going to go ahead and make this bigger so you can read it. These signs say, please have some manners in the Gyeonmachi South District. Uh, don't spread out and block the street because, you know, some of us still live here and they need to walk. Uh, please don't touch lanterns, fences, or doors on private houses. Uh, the one they haven't put up yet on this sign, but that are on some other signs too, are related to photography. And so uh, the ugly tourists that are out there really make it hard for the geishas to get to work because the tourists are like paparazzi and just really want to snap that picture of the Japanese woman walking down the street in the kimono and the white makeup. But like, how would you feel if that was you going to work and there were a thousand people standing in their way, taking your picture, popping in there for a selfie as you walk by? We need to let the people live their lives and not get in their way. Um, and so the, vi the residents are like fed up with the visitors. Uh, and so uh, the signs are gonna go up in uh, future weeks that'll not just have manners for these alleys, but are actually gonna ask tourists to not go into the alleys where the geishas tend to walk when they go to work uh, so that they don't get harassed. Now, the other couple things that Japan is experiencing, a lot of people heard this in the news, is over tourism and there was a question earlier in the chat about uh hey chris what destinations should we not go to in 2024 which is not the point of this video but the uh fact that we couldn't go anywhere for three or four years the fact that japan was closed for so long things that are like bucket list destinations have become completely overcrowded and one example is mount fuji the mount fuji climb uh Japan experienced so many people climbing it this past year. It was so busy. It was unenjoyable. There was trash on the path. And so they are going to be instituting a system where people want to hike Mount Fuji now. It won't be free. Hikers that hike Mount Fuji will be charged $13 each. And on the most popular trail, the number of hikers will be capped at 4,000 people daily. Um, and so, you know, that's something that we're like seeing round, round the world at uh, natural destinations are these like caps and lotteries. When I was in Zion National Park over the holidays, you know, I couldn't do the Angel's Landing hike anymore because I didn't win the lottery. I, I paid the $4 and I entered the lottery, but I didn't win it. So I couldn't do it because too many people had been on it, so they've had to limit the number of people that go there too. <laughs> Paintkiller93 says, I wish LA had an over-tourism problem. Yeah, you know, and I think that's like, there are places like Japan that clearly signal that they want tourists, and so lots of people come there. And then there are places like Los Angeles, they really seem to signal that they don't want tourists uh, and don't make the infrastructure so that people go. Uh, Sean says, it is very sad that people need to be told to be a decent person. It, it is sad. You're right. I agree. Uh, one, one of my memories from a previous trip in Japan is, uh, Osi Girl and I, we were in Sendai, Japan. So this is the biggest city in Northern Japan, North of Tokyo. And we were in like on one of their main shopping streets in a drugstore. And there was like a tour group of people that were there. And one of the men as part of this group was like speaking so loudly, like pretty much like yelling in this pharmacy that the staff actually came over and said, 
sir, we're gonna have to ask you to leave. <laughs> you know, like you're just being too loud. You're disrupting the other customers. You're you're gonna have to go outside because apparently there are people that haven't been taught some of those basic manners about how to not just be a good tourist but a good person in society. Uh, Liana says, I heard Japan recently offered a digital nomad visa. Maybe they should reconsider. I, I think Japan's thinking on the digital nomad visas are these like, in order to do that, you have to make at least six, the equivalent of like 60,000 US dollars a year. And so I think their thoughts is, well, by the time I bring in high income earners, then hopefully they don't have those problems of the loud talkers that I have to deal with. Although, uh, that very well might not be true. Uh, Okay, uh, and Ryan asked if I got my money back on the Zion hike. No, no, I, I, I paid money to join the lottery. I don't get my money back if I don't win. It's it pretty much a jip, if you ask me. All right, the fourth travel trend that needs to stop in 2024 is the proliferation of travel guidebooks and travel videos generated by artificial intelligence. Uh, how, how many of you have seen these things either on Amazon, an AI guidebook, or on YouTube, an AI video? Now, I tend to be more of a video watcher than a guidebook reader. The New York Times did a whole article about these guidebooks that are popping up on Amazon, and they pop up more in the videos because people can make more money on the guidebooks. Uh, and so, in the last year, Amazon and other online booksellers, it's not just an Amazon problem, they've been flooded with self-published guidebooks uh, that have a mysterious number of, of good and bad reviews. You look at it and you be like, well, it must be legit because all these people reviewed it, except they're not actually written by humans. I mean, they'll have a picture of somebody with a name, but even the picture of the person who wrote the book is often AI generated and so is the name. They don't exist because it's just a bunch of content that artificial intelligence has pulled together to make this book long but not well written or not interesting. Uh, the videos that I find tend to be on destinations that maybe don't have any other videos or any other good videos and the travel videos that are generated by AI tend to be along the lines of like things to do lists like 10 things to do in Bakersfield, California, and then the video is full of pictures, like a picture slideshow, and then AI-generated voice to talk about those things. And I guess maybe for some place like Bakersfield that doesn't have a good uh, Yellow Productions video, like Point Traveler says here, I only refer to Yellow Productions travel guides. If there's no other good videos, maybe that AI-generated video wins out. But the thing about it being read by an AI voice is half the stuff isn't even true because nobody has looked at that thing. Uh, Francine says we need an AI translator. Uh, that would certainly be better than the AI guidebook. Cutchville of Love says that is so scammy. Uh, it sure is. Uh, and Alex says it's not as bad as the guidebooks written by out of country companies. I remember Trip Hacks DC talked about a Washington DC tour book and it was a pic of the Capitol building in Olympia, Washington. That is absolutely hilarious. So uh, in 2024, definitely, uh, you know, on Amazon, if you're buying a guidebook, Make sure that's actually from like a publisher that you trust uh, and also beware of AI generated travel videos on your favorite video site. Uh, <laughs> Joe says, Chris, don't you sound like an AI? Sometimes I can do my robot voice. Robot, robot. The Curious Princess. Mm. She always likes Papa to do his robot voice. What's uh, Chris drinking today. Today, Chris is drinking some high mountain oolong tea brewed in Taiwan. All right. Uh, and Jose says, I'm currently watching from Bakersfield. Awesome, Jose. Uh, glad to hear that. Uh, and uh, Randy says, Plan In is a great option for real recommendations. Randy, that is a great point. So, planin.com, this hotel booking site that you've heard me talking about over the last few live streams, they absolutely try to enter in and solve that problem and say, hey, we're going to make sure that the hotel recommendations that we have on this site are curated by actual people, actual creators that you actually know. And so if you watch one of those uh, videos, you know that it can be real. And if you haven't signed up for planin.com yet, they also have some great hotel discounts. Uh, you can get like up to 40% off some hotels. We got like the win around Las Vegas for uh, way, way cheap. Like 
uh, New Year's Day for like a hundred and some on dollars. I mean, it was it was a significant percentage off. Uh, and so if you haven't signed up for Plan In yet and you want to check out all my reviews that are over there and you also want to uh, go ahead and get 40% off, uh, I'm going to go ahead and drop a link in the chat uh, where you can sign up right over there. Okay, great. Here, we'll... We'll put this. Uh, we'll put this on the top so it doesn't go away. Okay. But speaking of hotels, we're on the number five. Randy is a super great straight man. That the tip, the the trend that needs to go out the door in 2024 is the hotel rates. They keep going up and up. Hotel rates are on the rise, definitely. Uh, so Hilton and Marriott, in particular, they released their annual. Uh, earnings report for last year, and at Hilton's, their room rates are up more than 5% across the board from 2022. That's all of their hotels in the world. Uh, in the U.S., they were up 4%. European hotel rates jumped 12.8%, and Middle East and Africa were up 13%. Uh, over at Marriott, the hotel rates in the U.S. and Canada climbed about 5%. 7% in Europe and nearly 10% in the Middle East and Africa. A number that I don't have an exact number of, because uh, they didn't release these specific earnings reports or I didn't find them easily, uh, was the luxury property segment. Like if you're looking at JW Marriott's and Park Hyatt's and these luxury, you know, Conrad hotels and Waldorf Astoria's, those hotel rates are like through the moon. Like, I find them to be like double what they were prior to COVID. We are going to Banff. Uh, we're planning a trip to Banff and we want to stay at the Fairmont Springs Banff. And like in June, the hotel rates at that hotel are like $2,000 a night. I don't know who has that kind of money lying around for a hotel. I mean, I'm sure they're out there because the hotel must set that price and book it out. But it's like, it's insane. And we need to get our hotel prices back to the reasonable level while we still uh, get some amenities. And that's why I really feel cheated, right? You pay a bunch of money and then you don't even get your daily housekeeping anymore. So if you are looking to book a hotel in the near future and you want to check out my recommendations of what hotels is Chris like, uh, go ahead and check out that plan in link uh, where you can get some pretty good discounts on hotels, including the win in Las Vegas. Okay. The... Oh, but by the way, for plan.com, you do have to sign up if you want to see the rates uh, because they don't make them available to the public. That's how they can offer the good deals. You have to sign up using that link if you want to see them. All right. The sixth travel trend that has to see the door in 2024 is travel style shaming. Chris, what is that? Well, I, I really put this in the category related to authentic travel. You know, you've heard these people. They say like, oh, I don't. I don't want to go to tourist traps. I just, I just want, I just want to go authentic or be like, oh, well, if you're, you're going on a cruise, I mean, that's not, you won't really experience the place. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to go stay at a temple or I'm going to go stay in a Kwanzaa hut or in a teepee so that I can have a authentic travel experience. How, how could you possibly enjoy that guided bus tour that you're going on? Or if somebody tells you that you're, they're going to Rome, don't respond to them and say like, ah, I hate that place, that's such a tourist trap. If they're telling you, I'm going to Singapore, don't respond by saying it's too westernized or sterile. Uh, everybody's travel style is different and that's okay. Maybe some of us want to get around on a bicycle built for two. Maybe some of us want to rent a sports car. Maybe some of us want to ride a tuk-tuk. That is all okay. Nothing wrong with how different people prefer travel. There's a different experience for every walk of life. And frankly, I think if people are just out there enjoying the world, we should embrace whatever mode that is. Yes, even if they're taking the bus tour where all they do is stop out of the Eiffel Tower and take their picture and go on, they're at least getting off their sofa and into uh, the great world. So I say, uh, you know what? Give everyone space to vibe on their own in 2024, regardless of what color bicycle they have. Uh, by the way, this bicycle, in case you're curious, uh, the Curious Princess, she used to sit up on my handlebars. I have like a, uh, full suspension mountain bike that I generally take around. And so she was up there on the handlebars in a custom seat. 
you know, at some point she gets too big for that. And so this is the Yuba Combi bicycle. This is a long tail bicycle, so it has a longer backside on it so that that rear kid seat isn't like, she's not like flush up in my back, but she's actually like far enough away that like she can look around and enjoy the scenery. Uh, Codge Full of Vice says, to each their own, no shaming. Uh, Remy says, I only go places at theme parks nearby. Theme parks are absolutely pretty fun. Emmett says, look at that chariot, that bicycle. Um, and uh, photo walks. Uh, Jeff Graham says, I paid $50 a night in Kobe last December. Japan often has a bad rap when it comes to Japan being too expensive. Really good deals in Japan at a lot of places. And I bet that was actually probably a pretty decent hotel, Jeff. I mean, you had probably had like a bed and you probably had like running water, you know, where like for $50 in the USA, you're lucky if you even get a roof over your head. You can't often get a campground for less than $50. Uh, Gumer says, when I was traveling through Japan, I also found hotels to be very affordable. Since I was splitting with a buddy, we paid around $25 to $50 a night. I agree. Definitely one of the reasons I like Japan are the reasonable room rates. Uh, Points Traveler says, I need your help in convincing Mrs. Points Traveler to travel to Singapore. She's afraid of the humidity. It is humid in Singapore. The good news is there's lots of air conditioning. So she can go hang out at Orchard Road and all the shopping malls in her AC and you can go visit the Merlion and the zoo. That's what I would say. Um, okay, uh, and Jeff says, it was a very nice snazzy hotel, but a tiny room, right? That's how they make it cheap. They don't give you very much space. All right, the seventh, <laughs> the seventh trend that needs to see the door in 2024 kind of ties into the last one travel style shaming, but it's people saying, I don't want to be a tourist. Have you heard this one? I don't want to travel like a tourist because I should travel like a local. You might have even heard me before say like, it's good to travel like a local, but I feel like people take this too far when they like, ah, I don't want to do the touristy things. Like when I go to Singapore, I don't want to go see the Merlion. You know why these things are touristy? You know why the Eiffel Tower is touristy? You know why Times Square is touristy? Because they're cool. They're just cool things. And a lot of people want to go to those things. That's what makes them touristy. Just because a lot of people go there doesn't make them bad, doesn't make them any less authentic. And this is, the Merlion is authentically Singapore. I mean, it might not be like 200 years uh, history behind the Merlion, but definitely like, you know, Singaporeans know the icon of Singapore is this thing right here. Now, the other thing about like traveling like a local is say if you go to Las Vegas and you travel like a local, you're probably not gonna go to the Las Vegas Strip. Though most people are still gonna go to the Las Vegas Strip, but if you're really living like a local, you wouldn't go there because the locals, they don't go there all that much. I think conversely, something we all could do a little bit more wherever we live is actually try to experience some of the touristy things a little bit more. Uh, easy maybe for me to say, growing up in Southern California, growing up in San Diego, super big touristy town. And so some of the best things to do, some of the places people wanna go, the beach, Seaport Village, the Midway Museum, the big aircraft carrier in San Diego. And there are things where like, if you live in San Diego, you can easily never go to the touristy beaches, but you're like, Mission Beach is pretty cool because it has a roller coaster on it. That's why so many people go there. Uh, and I, uh, when I would go to the beach, I would absolutely go to the busy touristy beaches. I would just get there at nine in the morning before all the tourists were there. And then by the time they all showed up at 11, it was time for me to get out. Mm -hmm. uh, Patty says, I'm in a wheelchair. Do you think I would do okay in Singapore? I think you would, Patty. Singapore, super well-developed. Uh, so super uh, wheelchair friendly. The Narrow Road says there's a reason why everyone goes to Mather Point at the Grand Canyon. Besides it being close, it's one of the most fabulous views in the park. I agree. Uh, and if you don't know what Narrow Road is talking about, watch my Grand Canyon video that just came out last week. Two of them. You can watch my 90 minute vlog or you can watch the 30 minute uh, full travel guide on the Grand Canyon. And there's also actually like some coolness about Mather Point. It's this one like rock protrusion that has great views like a thousand people and it's probably not the best place to get 
your selfie at the park because you're gonna have a whole bunch of people around you, but it is a great place to like share in this like communal experience of people seeing the Grand Canyon for the first time. And I think there's absolutely something special in that too. Uh, Adriana says, I agree if it's first time, you have to visit touristy places at least once, like Times Square in my case. I agree, like go visit them, be like, that's what, I know what Times Square looks like now. And I, I'll say me in New York City, I tend to visit Times Square like a moth to a flame. I don't hang out there for hours on end, but like if I'm in New York City, I feel like it's my due diligence to at least walk through it at some point again, to be like, oh, what does it look like now? How's it changed? There used to be a Toys R Us in Times Square that was like two or three stories and it had a Ferris wheel inside. I mean, I don't know if that thing is there anymore, but that was super cool. Uh, and Wu Taiwan says the Merlion right here is the king. I agree, the Merlion uh, is the king of tourist symbols. All right, travel trend number eight that needs to end in 2024 are the all neutral everything hotels and hotel rooms. You've all seen them where everything in the hotel room looks like this. It's a shade of gray or a shade of brown. I don't know how we got to this place for hotel rooms where you go in a hotel room and you're like, is it nice? It's hard to say. I mean, is this nice? This is fine. This is a fine hotel. This is a comfortable hotel room. This is a hotel room that has everything you need. It has space and a bed and it's well maintained, but it is boring. There is nothing about this room that you remember. As someone who takes pictures of so many hotel rooms, and I go to Google Photos and I type in hotel rooms and I get these things and I look at this picture and I'm like, I couldn't tell you which hotel this was from because it looks like 50 other hotels that I've stayed in. And, uh, you know, it's not just, uh, and it's not just like the Hampton Inns and the Courtyard Merits of the world. We're seeing this in like destinations that used to be cool, like Las Vegas, you know, the Fountain Blue that just opened. Unfortunately, I feel like they went for a little bit of this aesthetic in the Fountain Blue, like some hotels, uh, the Venetian, the Bellagio, they like, they're over the top in their Italian theming and they're super busy because of it. And then there's places like the Fountain Blue who you stay in the room and you're like, it's nice, but it's not, like if I take a picture in the room and send it to people, people wouldn't know where it is because it's just not that amazing. Maybe it's a comfortable hotel room. As a hotel room snob, I like comfortable, but I also think there's something to be said for memorable, different, and unique. Uh, one of my favorite hotels uh, that I've stayed in is the Tokyo Station Hotel. And the Tokyo Station Hotel, it is in Tokyo, in the main train station in Tokyo. And what's like so unique about this place in the biggest city in Japan is they made the Tokyo Station Hotel look exactly like a hotel would in London. It's, it's like super British themed with the white crown molding and all this stuff and like even the people who work at the hotel wear the very like prim and proper British bellboy hats and all these sorts of things and like it's over the top and you could say it's almost silly but you like look out your window of your super British room and then you're like there are 10,000 people crossing at this pedestrian intersection every three minutes. I am definitely in Tokyo but I wouldn't know it by looking in this room but it's such a juxtaposition that it's absolutely memorable. Uh, and Xian says, yes, the Tokyo Station Hotel got five tofers. Indeed, one of the few that got five tofers. Uh, Art says, understated luxury is best. So like the Wynn Hotel, I think fits in that category of understated luxury, but the room is so nice, like with its, uh, maybe like uh, the trim and all these things that it absolutely is memorable at that level, not in the same blow you away as the Venetian or the Bellagio, uh, but something like this is just a little too understated for me. Uh, Greg says, I understand your point, but for me, a hotel is usually just a place to sleep and put my stuff. Greg, maybe because you haven't found any rooms that are amazing enough that you want to be like, I need to stay in this room. But I also, Greg, I at different times in my life, I've been in those places, different trips, I'm in those places too. Uh, but I think 
what what I hate to see is I hate to see the loss of character across the board as if somehow hotels just have to be a place to sleep and put our stuff. I'm gonna use the parallel in Japan again where if you watched our trip from last year in Japan, staying at some of these amazing luxury resorts in Japan, the Hoshino resorts in Atami had a ball pit in the lobby. They brought toys in the room for our daughter. It was, uh, it was the beds, had like a rail on the side so our daughter didn't fall off. We booked the, the like the we put on our room that we had a three-year-old child with us. And so then even like in the bathroom, they put like a kitty seat next to the toilet, right? But like all these little things about like our daughter walks into the room and sees a big bucket of toys, you know, to be like, ah, there's toys in the hotel room, right? Like that little experience just being slightly different than this putting a bed rail up on the side doesn't cost them that much more to do, but it makes the hotel unique enough to be memorable. There's one uh, also that I'll mention, the Shade Hotel in Redondo Beach that we stayed in like 2020, 2021 or something. Uh, it, uh, the mattresses were Tempur-Pedic mattresses, so like super plush foam mattresses, and the room had two bathtubs, one, in the uh, bathroom where the bathtub usually goes and a second one on the balcony, like huge soaking tub out on the balcony uh, with views of the marina. And if you wanted to, it had like a curtain, you could close off the balcony in case you want to take a real bath out there instead of a bath with your swimwear on. But there's another one where like our daughter just like loved the bathtub on the balcony. And when we're doing the room tour, going out and being like that, is, is there, there's a bathtub on the right? Like uh, those experiences, I think ones uh, we need hotels to bring back again. All right. I have one more about hotels, uh, which is I think we really need to stop it with the corporate boutique and lifestyle hotels. Uh, so there are legitimately kind of like cool boutique hotels. This is one that was pretty cool that we stayed in. Who's in Bakersfield? Somebody's in Bakersfield. They can identify this hotel, the Padre Hotel uh, Boutique, because it looks different and fresh and rooms look different. But I feel like when the big corporates try to do it, it just never, it doesn't feel authentic. Like it feels like cookie cutter different. And it feels like when I stay in these corporate lifestyle chains, I definitely feel like I'm staying in a cookie cutter lifestyle chain. Like they did this same room in 20 different hotels. Uh, and it just, there was a neat hotel that we stayed in in, Visalia, California, that the hotel used to be like a government building that had like, it was like maybe the county office or something like that. And so it had a big safe in it. Like they didn't remove the safe when they made it a hotel. Like, so you can like stay in the room that has the safe. <clears throat> anyway, the big chains see hotels like that doing well. And then they say, well, I want to, I want to get in on this. Uh, and so French chain, Accor, they own a wide swath of brands from uh, the Ibis all the way up to the glitzy Ravels, Orange Express. They even own Fairmont now. They have said uh, where they really see growth for them is in the lifestyle category of hotels. And I just, like, like a lifestyle hotel. I'm like, what, what is a lifestyle hotel anyway, you know? Mm. The W Hotel is an example of a lifestyle hotel, which I, I tend to describe as like funky and strange and not very comfortable. <clears throat> I know that this trend saying stop this could seem to go against my all neutral everything hotels in hotel rooms, but I think we can't have funky at the expense of comfort, but we also don't need gray and brown as the only colors in our color palette. Okay. the. 10th trend that we need to stop in 2024, and uh, then we're gonna go into some positive trends to see this year, is <clears throat> AI chatbots that wanna help you with everything. You know, it seemed like uh, 2023 was the year of ChatGPT, and so 2024 is the year of every travel company trying to use ChatGPT or a chatbot to help you plan your travel, to help you with customer service. I mean, I... I really seem to like, uh, I don't seem, I definitely dislike 
the AI chatbots as a replacement for customer service, you know, to be like, well, before you can talk to an agent, you gotta talk to this AI chatbot for a little while. And then after you've talked to them and you don't get an answer, then you can talk to an agent. Uh, I also, last year I did a video all about like AI tools that can help you with your travel. And there were like all these services that cropped up that wanna charge you some monthly or yearly fee to use AI, to help plan you an itinerary, except, you know, uh, AI never, doesn't always get things right, you know? And like, you look at it as somebody uninformed about Rome and be like, this looks like a great itinerary, except you get there and you're like, none of these places are near each other. This place is closed. This place doesn't even exist. Uh, and so I think there is a ton of value in people actually helping you with those things and not just listening to AI chatbots. Uh, Wu Tai One says, I want real robots I can deal with or nothing at all. I'm in. Real robots, I'm totally in. Like, if I was dealing with this robot, by the way, this robot was in Taipei Songshan Airport, uh, which has the best acronym out there, TSA. Uh, and this was while we were going from Taipei to Tokyo Haneda. All right. Um, Sid says, Hilton's chatbot Cynthia kept sending me text while I was there. Did you find any of them useful, Sid? <laughs> I'm curious, right? Here we go. We're going to use this chatbot so we don't have to have a human check up on you. What about this? Would you like this? Would you like some of this? Except none of it comes from a person, which means none of it is real. Or is it really? Or if it was helpful, would it, would it be useful? Except I just don't think they've reached that place of actually helpful. Uh, <laughs> Emmett says, I asked an AI bot in the MGM where I can get a Coke. It told me to talk to Marcus behind the dumpsters. Awesome. Uh, Francine says, I would immediately press zero. Jenny Fides says, I hate all of this AI crap. Uh, and Paint Killer says, Japan did it right. My Hiroshima hotel had a dancing robot that also gave you general hotel info. I think it could also check you in and check you out. That is what I'm talking about right there. Japan, you are doing it right. Narrow Road says, I can only... Think of one time when a chatbot actually helped me without needing to chat with a human. Uh, and uh, Wu Taiwan says, I always love the ren text from a nation when you cross the international border, just letting you know you're being watched. And Brandon says, I wouldn't be surprised if this reaches the cruise ship industry. I'm sure it will. To be like, hey, did you know that the buffet is open right now? Or whatever it might be. And the eggs are fresh. They just got put out there. Okay, so uh, those are the trends that need to go in 2024. Now I wanna share with you some positive trends that we can look forward to this year. The first one is luxury train travel on the rise, whether you want a Duplo Lego train or an actual real train. But travel booking platforms are reporting tremendous growth for luxury rail trips, where the journey, in fact, yes, is the destination. Uh, and so many train lines are actually like, upping their game on kind of like hotel trains, better dining, better first class type experiences. Uh, and um, the uh, in Asia, the Eastern and Oriental Express is making a comeback. Um, so you can take that train. Uh, in Japan, there are many scenic train journeys. Like Japan's understood this for a long time. Switzerland has really great like scenic trains that you can take. Uh, and in Europe, uh, in Rome, there's gonna be like some new train lines that are also building on the Orient Express. Like the Orient Express, I feel like it's something that like people are like, oh, like that seems cool to go from Europe to the Orient, you know? Maybe I can do that again. Maybe that's a great way to spend my travel. Enjoy the view out of the window of these places I haven't been and not have to suffer with airports or cruise ship terminals or those sorts of things. And Paint Killer says, is it basically a land cruise? Yeah. You could say that, basically a land cruise. Okay, uh, also related to trains, train stations are becoming the new foodie destinations. Um, so, you know, in many places in the world, train stations are often thought of just places that people pass through, but as places that there is, as, as places where there are a lot of people, those people get hungry. And so luckily the train station operators have figured out, hang on idea. How about we put food here while people are waiting for the train or where they get off the train? Uh, in particular, Union Station here in Washington, D.C. Uh, they've opened up a ton of eateries in Union Station. It used to just be shops and 
COVID killed all the shops. And now they're like, well, you know what it's gonna be? It's gonna be restaurants. There's like a Shake Shack in there and a pot belly sandwich and a lot of pretty good place to eat in that train station. So next time you're taking the train, uh, take a look and see if there's some actually pretty good eats in the train station that you're passing through. Don't just try to get in and out of there uh, as fast as you can. Trend number three is silent travel. What's the trend of silent travel? Well, in the age of overstimulation where we all need to get away from our digital devices, silent travel is about unplugging, getting in a way, and even just being quiet. Uh, so these could be things like secluded nature resorts, sleep retreats, quiet hotels, silent walking tours, and you've probably even seen the silent disco where people wear headphones to listen and dance to the disco, but there's no sound uh, to the outside world. So um, if you are looking to get away from it and have a um, really sensory, almost like deprivation experience, right? This is a new wave of travel. Side note, if you ever stay in a hotel uh, that has this sign next to your bed with earplugs, beware, beware. This is like, this is one of those when I see this on my nightstand, I'm like, I I am not gonna sleep very well, am I? I, uh, I tend to ask for a quiet room in most hotels. Um, and of course, then sometimes I'll get the like, sir, I don't, I don't think we have any quiet rooms. I'm like, oh, I may have to reconsider waiting up where I'm, whether I'm staying here tomorrow night or not then. Okay. Uh, oh, I see Josh from uh, California through my lens is on. Josh, good to see you. And he says, I've been wanting to start doing train travel. Josh, I think that'd be awesome. You know, there's one like, where did I see it go to? Uh, like, not the Grand Canyon train. Where were we? No, in Canada. Like from Vancouver, like in the like the Canadian Rockies or something. There's like a luxury train that goes through there. Anyway, some of those trains look pretty, pretty neat. Okay. Uh, trend number four that we're going to see in 2024 is more cool travel. I don't mean to travel where the cool people are, like to Miami. You might uh, figure out by my picture. I mean, travel to cold destinations with global warming or whatever you want to call it. Many places getting hotter in the world. Uh, there's going to be many people in the summer looking to escape that summertime heat and go to someplace cold. Uh, so I think we're going to see more like cross hemisphere trips. You know, if you're in the northern hemisphere and it's hot, go down to the southern hemisphere where uh, it will tend to be cooler. You know, the trend used to be everybody wants to go where it's hot and hit the sand at the beach. Uh, but I think booking cool vacations can lead you to actually enjoying destinations when they're not that crowded. You know, I did the Grand Canyon, Bryce Canyon, Zion Canyon in the um, height of December in the winter with snow. But because of that, nobody was there and I could park anywhere I want to. There was no traffic, no wait. Like, it was great. Uh, and you go in the summer and like, you can't park. So, you know, consider a coolcation in 2024. <laughs> Connie says, my wimpy Californian nice skin cannot handle cold vacations. I get it, just get a, just get a jacket. That's what I say. Uh, and Wu Tai says related to train travel is trains with glass tops are the way to go. And Paint Killer says, I like overnight trains. And Justin says, I went to Alaska in the October and absolutely loved it. Covered in snow, but not crazy cold yet. That's a great tip for when to go to Alaska. Okay. Uh, trend number five is that we're going to see wellness travel at a whole new level. That's why I have a picture of a spa right here. Where's the picture of the spa? Oakland, Chinatown. I don't know if this spa ever opens, really. I wasn't quite sure. Uh, but... The new trend related to wellness travel is not just places where you might go and you might have a yoga class, but, you know, wellness is a buzzword because people have 
realize that, you know, not everybody's the healthiest all the time or they're too stressed out. And so they want to go someplace and we might call it longevity travel. They want to go someplace and have an experience that makes them live longer because everybody's still looking for the fountain of youth to make their skin look younger. Uh, and so, you know, these might be the type of resorts where you're not just going for your yoga, but uh, maybe you get like poolside vitamin IV, you know, where you get like an IV drip in there to give you all the vitamins uh, that you need. Seriously, in actually in Vegas, there are more and more IV drip places in hotels in the Fountain Blue. Wasn't open when I was there yet. Maybe it's open now. There was like an IV drip place. You had a hard night on the town. Go and go and get something in your veins to make you feel better. Um, some other examples of this, the Four Seasons Resort uh, in Maui administers treatments such as stem cells and NAD+. Plus. I don't even know what that is. Uh, and then at the Hotel Hanalei Bay in Kauai, guests are welcomed with a B12 vitamin shot uh, in the new wellness-specific rooms that include recovery-boosting infrared light mats. All right, so if anybody stays there, you'll have to let me know if the infrared light mask really boosts your mood. Uh, Adriana says, I got the best foot massage in Chinatown in New York City. I believe it that the best foot massages actually come out of uh, Chinatowns or Asia Towns. Kajful loves as I get older. I just want to go refresh and relax. Wellness sounds good. Maybe without the needles, huh? The sixth thing we're gonna see in 2024, we're gonna see more shoulder season travel. This might be good, this might not be good, we'll see. <laughs> Why might not be good? Well, historically, we would see a peak of travel in the summer, and then these shoulder seasons around the summer, not that much travel, and then a peak of travel often around the December, January holidays. Uh, but um, many destinations are seeing more travel in the seasons in like uh september like in particular um you know there was like one town in europe which said they actually saw more people coming in september than in august um and so why is this why is this interesting well if you're somebody who enjoyed shoulder season travel <laughs> like like me right here i love to go places in september and october and uh maybe april and may because they're often not that busy but now people are like well maybe i don't need to pack all my travel into the summer maybe i'll spread it out through the year maybe i have more flexibility to work at home or work remotely and so i'm not seeing as many great deals in the shoulder season as i used to see before or you have to book even earlier to really get those uh good shoulder season or not too busy uh not too busy destinations the last one I don't have a picture of right here, uh, but I think we're gonna see more travel outside the theme park. What I mean by that, there was a comment earlier that I saw where somebody says, I only like to go to theme parks and that's cool. And there's been a lot of people that I think have used theme parks as like the anchor for their trip. Uh, but I think we're seeing a lot of people that might have been in that place where like they were Disneyland and Disney World travelers. And because those places have gotten so expensive, they have. Uh, that we've got a lot of those people that are looking for things to do outside the theme park because uh, they have not saved up the $10,000 for their week at Disney World for a family of four. Um, Patty in SoFlo says, we took five cruises in shoulder season and it was great. Uh, and Grant says, the NAD Plus infusions are incredible. All right, I guess I need to look into that. So I need to figure out what the NAD Plus is. Well, fellow explorers, those are the travel trends, good and bad. None of them are reasons to stop you from traveling, but, you know, if you have been on this live stream since the beginning or you watch the archive from the beginning, you know, let's go ahead and figure out how we can stop all those trends that we need to show the door in 2024 and take advantage of all these great new trends uh, that are going to be positive to the industry here, too. Fellow explorers, it is now Q&A time. If you've got a question, I've got an answer. All right, fellow explorers, it is Q&A time. Uh, <clears throat> what is my name? Says Disney is terrible now. It's actually insane how expensive it is. I have been like a lifelong Disney annual pass holder. Maybe not lifelong, but from the age of 21, from when Chris turned 21 and spent his 21st birthday at Disneyland, I held a Disneyland annual pass all the way till COVID. 
and I've not gotten another one since then. And not just because we have a young daughter and don't want to spend the money on her, but because of these source reports that the park has lost a bit of its magic and it's become so expensive. It's just like, it's hard to justify for us. Those, I, there's plenty of people that can still justify the costs, but uh, we haven't, we haven't re-embraced it the same way we used to when it was a magical place not designed to um, vacuum all of these uh, videos out. Painkiller says, will these trend videos be separated? What do you mean, Painkiller? Like, am I gonna like, Cut them out as short. I haven't really got into that all that much from these live streams. I don't know. I haven't done like the clips things or things like that. Uh, so no, I I was not planning to make separate ones on them, but let me know. Uh, Art says YouTube is influencing travel decision in a major way. I absolutely believe that too, where we're going to see uh, all of us, right? Me included, plan our travels around uh, what people recommend on YouTube. People that we, like we know, like, you know, we have a... What's the term for this? It's a parasocial relationship, right? Like, you know me, I know many of you through the chat. I've met many of you in person too, not all 182 of you that are on the live stream right now. Uh, but like, you're like, oh, I like this guy. I've listened to him a lot. The things he likes, I generally seem to like. And so the thing he likes, you know, maybe I'll give that a try too. Uh, Points Traveler uh, just mentioned he's been a member for the past six months, helping to support the channel. Thank you very much, Points Traveler. I very much appreciate your support. Adriana says, when you travel, do you take a converter or an adapter? Uh, adapter? So like a power converter would be something that would convert voltage from one to another. Most modern electronics, cell phone chargers, battery chargers, that sort of stuff, uh, they'll do it automatically. When you need the converter for power is when you like need to run an old school appliance, maybe like a curling iron or something like that. Many of the big luxury hotels, like the JW Merritt in Hong Kong will have voltage converters if you so need one. So we try to stay in places that maybe we could borrow one if we need to. But yes, we always bring adapters. We look up what we need and then tend to just bring the small adapters instead of the universal ones. Uh, Alex in the chat uh, has leveled up. Uh, Points Traveler says, hey, I've been, a, I've been a member for nine months. I feel like it's longer than that. Thank you, Alex, for your support too. Um, Jenny Fide still says, still hoping for a meet and greet. I, uh, I need to get more on that too. So thank you for the reminder, Jenny Fide. Um, Art says, are USB Bluetooth speakers socially acceptable? I mean, I guess it depends where you're using your USB Bluetooth speaker. If you're like sitting at the park or something like that, listening to your tunes, it probably is. If you're sitting on the airplane with your USB Bluetooth speaker, it's probably not. Burton says, I need advice on Oahu. My wife and I will be renewing our vows there in April. Any location recommendations and how can we find a good photographer? I have no good photography tips because I don't um, I don't uh, know any photographers on Oahu. But if there's anybody here uh, on the stream right now or in the archive that can help a fellow explorer out, if you had a good photographer in Oahu, let Burton know uh, maybe their name or how to contact them. Uh, but I think related to like mar marriage marriage stuff is what I'm going to call it. Renewing the vows, uh, Koolina. Uh, has a ton of like um, we wedding related places. So I think Ko'olina on that side of the island might be a pretty special place to do it on Oahu. And it's generally less crowded over there. So I feel like it has a more special vibe than someplace like Waikiki. So that would be my recommendation right there. Uh, Alex says, I wouldn't be a member if it wasn't for Chris's fine content. And you are a fine gentleman yourself, Alex. Uh, Jerry says, Chris, the Grand Canyon vlog was epic. Awesome. Thank you for getting through all 90 minutes of it, Jerry. Uh, Tim Watts says, you ever stayed at a graduate hotel? I did. I stayed in a graduate hotel in Annapolis, Maryland, uh, which actually was a lot of fun. I liked the graduate hotel. Yes. And so it is one where like I would put in the category about like, I'd like more hotels to be like that. It was one that I generally like, enjoyed walking around the hotel to check it out. But you know, when I check into the next courtyard by Marriott hotel, I don't have much desire to look around because there's nothing <laughs> interesting to see. doesn't matter what hallway I, uh, go down. Uh, CIA HD says, did you stop at the horseshoe bend? I did not. If I did, it would have been in the vlog. Uh, I just did not have enough time to go to Horseshoe Bend. I stopped in Page, Arizona to eat lunch, uh, but kept on, kept on going. Uh, 
Alex says he's got a whole bunch of new camera gear, but he's uh, not in Oahu. So uh, Burton, sorry, that doesn't help you out all that much. Uh, Sherry says uh, Ko'olina in Hawaii is a beautiful place too. Um, and uh, Connie says, what's the weirdest hotel you've stayed in, Chris? The most weirdest hotel. Uh, hmm. I... It was an it was an Accor chain hotel. What was the brand? I don't even remember the brand anymore. It was a, a hotel that I stayed at in the south of France. And it's the Ice Story. That I tell. It's not that the hotel itself was weird. Okay, weirder hotel. <laughs> weirder hotel. Uh, the Saint Tropez in Las Vegas. Maybe it was one of the worst hotels I've stayed in, which is what makes it weird. But it was the one of those where like I check in and I'm like, Hey, can I get a quiet room? And the guy's like. There are no quiet rooms here, man. I'm like, oh, okay. I get to the room, the air conditioning doesn't work. They come in the, in Vegas, which is really awful. And then they're like, okay, well, we can fix that. Uh, and they come in and turn the air conditioner on, but they're like, but you're gonna need this bucket over here because we turn the air conditioner on, the air conditioner's drip, so there's your bucket. I'm like, this is, this is great. This is what I get for booking two days in advance, which is why I don't, why I don't do that anymore. All right. Uh, Liana says, we ever do a camping excursion video? I'm not huge on the camping. Not huge on the camping. We might do some glamping, but you're probably not going to see any serious camping videos here on Yellow Productions. Uh, Art says, you ever left a hotel because it was really bad? I have left hotels because they're really bad. Yeah. Um, Brian says, Madonna Inn is weird but awesome. In San uh, Luis Obispo, Madonna Inn. I've not stayed there, but... Uh, you know, now that I do more hotel reviews, I would, I would actually have to stay there. Uh, there was a question about, Justin says, what's your thoughts on self-serve TSA? I, I'm all in on self-serve TSA, really. This is the, like, in the U.S., they're, like, um, trialing this, like, self-service security checkpoint. I need to go find one and go through it, because I just want to go through the experience. Joe, uh, says, how's Marseille? Uh, did you have a travel video? I did not. Uh, of course, I've been to Marseille a bunch of times, but... Uh, that was sort of like my pre really being as dedicated as I am now about making travel content. So uh, no Yellow Productions travel videos exist on Marseille. Uh, Arts is no camping because no showers. That's not as bad for me. Uh, really, it's like the lack of a toilet nearby. And I, you know, probably because I drink so much, I have a small bladder, which means like I'm someone that needs to go potty a couple times a night. Mm. Which, leaving my tent to walk to wherever that is, not, uh, not something I really enjoy in the middle of the night. Art says, have you ever made lifelong friends from a hotel stay? I've talked to a lot of people in hotels, uh, but I don't think I've ever made any lifelong friends that I've met at a hotel. Uh, but then again, I also don't like stayed a bunch of like hostels and things like that where I'm like, oh, let's hang out, let's go places. And then now in sort of the content creation game, I mean, obviously I'm either with the family or if I'm not with the family, then I'm like on a mission to make videos. And so I'm not really like hanging around chatting with random people. Not that I don't like chatting with people, but I'm like, I'm usually on a mission and like from my room and out the door to wherever I need to film. Adriana says, do you check uh, for bed bugs in your accommodation? I tend to, I tend to like to think I stay in places that aren't prone to tons of them, but obviously as we found in some of the Vegas hotels, any hotel can be prevalent to bed bugs. I mean, I look at the bed, I don't like put like a black light on it or things like that. Uh, when we stayed at the Ondas in Maui, my mom and I, I've stayed there a couple times, both OC Girl and I and my mom and I, we had a, we had a gecko in our room, so that was exciting. So we called the front desk for them to like catch the gecko. Apparently a pretty regular occurrence uh, in Maui. They weren't like surprised at all to hear we had a gecko and they sent like two people up to the room to like catch the gecko in our room. Uh, Art says, people say you make friends in cruises. True, I could see how you could make friends on cruises because on many cruises, they'll seat you with the same people at the dinner table every night. So you have like every day to chat with these people. Um, 
I've not been on enough cruises to make friends. And when we were on the last Disney cruise, we were at another table and then he's like, they sat with a similar family that also had like a three-year-old, which meant that we actually didn't have much time to talk to each other because we were spending most of our time tending to the, the, uh, <laughs> the, the uh, kids seated at our table. Uh, Jean says, hey, Chris, go to Singapore soon. Is Grab pretty readily easy to book on the app? Where do you take taxi, MRT? Thanks. Uh, Jean, all of the above. Um, Jean, if you have not watched my Singapore travel guide and Singapore vlog, check out both of those. You can see in the Singapore vlog, I took a lot of taxis uh, just because I wanted to make videos, but the MRT, super good, super clean. Uh, Grab, super easy to call as well. So all the above. The Singaporeans will say that Chris was very wasteful for all the taxis that he took. Chris responds and says the taxis were cheap. They were like $20 or less a ride, and it meant that I could save an hour and make another video, and that was important to me since that's why I was in Singapore. Um, Joe says, can you replace food or drink taken from your hotel fridge without getting charged for it? It depends on the hotel minibar. If you're at the ones in Vegas where, like, you lift it, and they charge you for it 30 seconds later, no, putting it back won't help. But if you're at the ones that they inventory manually, then absolutely. Uh, Liana says, collab with California through my lens. Josh and I have done a couple in the past, but I am always up for another one. Uh, Grant wants to know any progress updates on the LA Vegas train. Moving along, uh, got more funding. Like, I mean, it's still not gonna be a while. They like, the, the latest news was about like pricing where they're like, oh, the trains, I think there's like the train from LA to Vegas when it opens and the first leg of it's gonna go from like Rancho Cucamonga to Vegas or or is it Victorville to Vegas? I don't know, like not really near LA, but they're like, the trains are gonna be like uh, demand priced. So if it's busy, they'll cost more. If it's less busy, they'll cost less. But like in like peak, peak demand, the round trip train ride, they're estimating will be like $400, like $200 each way. So uh, maybe it might not be as cheap as people think. Sean says, do you have a favorite train travel experience? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that like <clears throat> one of my most memorable train travel experiences was uh, taking the train up to the Jungfrau in Switzerland. It's this cog wheel train that goes up this mountain in this very picturesque area. Eventually it just starts going into the tunnel inside the mountain and then you get up to this like, what seems to have been originally built as like a like an Arctic research center into all of these tunnels. Like it's a pretty neat train ride. Uh, so that is uh, one of my favorite. Uh, Art says you travel to Singapore to make YouTube videos only. Yes, I travel to Singapore to make YouTube videos only and then meet up with uh, Oxy Girl and the Princess who were in Taipei. They went ahead a couple weeks to Taipei. I veered off to Singapore. So yes, I could only make travel videos because my Singapore series did really well uh, maybe seven years ago when I made the first one. OC Girl and I went there on that trip. And so since I was going out to that area, I'm like, I would like to update that series. Mm -hmm. The dedication for YouTube. Uh, Points Traveler says, where is your next trip? Uh, next big trip we're gonna do is to Banff in Canada, um, which is also Calgary. Uh, and uh, Painkillers says nothing beats your first high-speed rail Shinkansen. I love the Shinkansen or the bullet train in Japan. Uh, anytime I ride that, it's one of my favorite rides. One of my best experiences on the Shinkansen. I don't remember what leg it was on. It, it was probably near uh, Sendai, Japan, where uh, like as they push the food cart, they actually had like pot stickers on the food cart because uh, near Sendai, there's a town called, oh, oh, uh, Utsunomiya, Utsunomiya, and it's like a pot sticker town. They're famous for their pot stickers or their gyoza. Uh, and I just remember having like some really delicious gyoza on the Shin Kansen. Uh, Art says, Chris, have you gotten a YouTube for life tattoo? Not yet, but maybe I should. And Points Traveler says, uh, make sure you watch Chris's Jungfrau video if you plan to travel there. It was extremely helpful. Thank you for that, Points Traveler. Uh, yes, it's the time you've been waiting for. It's time for the giveaway. All right, fellow explorers in every live stream, I always give away 
t-shirt to folks on the live stream if you can answer my question. And my question to you is, there was an airport that I showed a picture of a robot in. What is the name of that airport? And what is the acronym of that airport? And if you put those two things together in the chat on the same line, you will win this Yellow Productions Crew shirt shipped to you anywhere in the world. If you don't get to win one and you want to pick one up for you, your favorite friend or family member, you can head over to the Yellow Production shop right here. And if you're like Chris, when is the next live stream? You can sign up for the Yellow Productions update right here, where I'll send you an email every time I schedule one of these live streams, let you know what the topic is, what the time is, so you can decide whether you want to join live or not. Uh, all right. And now we have a winner, winner chicken dinner. Congratulations to da, 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 Meritocratic Mafia. Meritocratic Mafia, you were the first person to put Taipei Songshan TSA Airport in the chat. Panjo beat you by time, but incorrect spelling, Sanchai Airport. Uh, Meritocratic Mafia got that right. Uh, second place goes to Leanna, but uh, sorry, second place, no shirt today. Meritocratic Mafia, the shirt goes to you. Send me an email, chris at yellow-productions.com. We'll get that headed right over to you. Fellow explorers, as usual, it's been a great time hanging out with y'all today. If you were on the archive and you made it to the end, thank you very much for making it to the deep end. And as usual, I won't say goodbye because I'll see you in the next video.